for the final presentation today for the dark side of molecular motors harnessing storing solar energy. Thank you so much. The dark side. The dark side. So I mean, it was Star Wars Day on Friday, so we had to kind of go towards that a little bit. So we have the dark side of molecular motors. So when we think about molecular motors, we usually think about having some sort of light stimulus, um, which I'll talk um, a little bit about. Um, so Allison and, and talked a little bit about this tree that's kind of been the overarching goal of our entire projects for this weekend. Um, we've actually kind of gone towards the top of this tree and trying to just develop a project that we can actually target these um, overarching goals. And our overarching goal for this particular project is energy storage systems. So there's a couple of current strategies for um, energy storage systems. Um, the first being thermal energy. So we can harness actually a lot of energy from the melting of ice, um, which I didn't actually know until um, this weekend. Uh, we have electrochemical or chemical uh, means of storing energy that could be in the form of batteries or something similar to that. There's also this mechanical energy, so we can use potential energy if we have water flowing from one side of a dam to another or something similar on the, along these lines. Um, so we can also take inspiration from nature. Nature does this perfectly. They have developed these complex systems, photochemical systems in this particular case using photosynthesis to convert light into chemical energy. They can use that energy for basic biological processes and also very complex biological processes. Um, so we can convert carbon dioxide and water into these really useful components of a system uh, that they can do these really complex, um, I guess, uh, work, I guess. Um, so our specific strategy is we want to store light or chemical energy as mechanical energy. And we're going to be using this Feringa motor or Feringa type motors um, to drive this torsional stress in a pair of polymers that are locked at the rotor um, by some sort of disulfide bridge. Um, and then we can release that mechanical energy by doing a reductive process to break that disulfide bridge. And then our long-range goals is using these for actuating molecular machines in vivo, not just ex vivo, um, and then also converting light energy into this electrical energy. And we can kind of use the uh, rubber band uh, airplane uh, analogy to kind of guide us in how we develop our molecular machine or the, our integrated molecular machine. We're not just using the molecular machine, we're actually integrating it into a complex molecule. So we think of this, this uh, rubber band or airplane, we can twist the propeller, and then once we release the propeller, it can fly. We're actually using this, storing this mechanical energy, and we can use it for some sort of work. So we got inspired, um, I kind of stole this, this GIF that uh, Jonathan had in his previous um, presentation. Um, it's also in the CNN news article for this, um, where Giuseppini and his um, co-workers developed these uh, Feringa type motors along with a modulator to actuate um, a bulk material and also expand that material using those modulators. Um, so we were inspired by the entanglement of these um, polymer chains using these motors and also the modulators to basically get some sort of topological change. But we wanted to use these in a new way and we wanted to use this for um, storing mechanical energy. So we have developed this kind of fancy um, uh, Feringa type motor that we'll be using to store our mechanical energy. So we have basically um, a couple of different components. The first being obviously this Feringa type motor. Um, this was um, inspired by the Giuseppini paper that I had mentioned from Nature Nanotech, where you can shine a uh, UV light on it and it starts to rotate. That rotation is, can, or that, that Feringa motor is coupled to these long polymer chains. These could either be peg-based chains, so these glycol chains, or they could be something sim uh, similar to that. They could be polyamines. We throw in some protons, it'll change the complete architecture. So we have these polymer chains that are connected to this Feringa type motor. As soon as we add in UV light, it will start to rotate. It'll entangle those peg chains that we have installed into this moiety that are tethered to this rotaxane-based compound, or this rotaxane-based moiety, I guess. <coughs> Um, so once we, uh, we have this disulfide um, bridge that is connecting our entire molecule together, so it cannot twist, there is less degrees of freedom once we start rotating that Feringa motor. So as soon as we um, cleave that disulfide bond through some sort of uh, disulfide reduction, um, we will actually get rotation around that rotaxane. But it is restricted from sliding off of the rotaxane by some sort of stopper. Um, so this, in, in 
in theory, what we believe is that we'll actually release some sort of mechanical energy that we can either store or trap or actually use um, in some sort of way. All right, so in experimentation, when we think about this, um, how do we actually re uh, def uh, develop or re uh, figure out how fast this is actually spinning? So once we store all that mechanical energy, we have to have some sort of way of determining exactly how much is being stored. Um, that is where the experimentation lies. I think the synthesis is going to be tricky in itself, but also <coughs> developing and figuring out ways to um, basically characterize this entire system. Um, that's kind of the overall arching goal for this particular project. Um, so we can do a couple of different studies. Um, like I said, those two polymer chains that I showed in the uh, scheme could either be PEG or a poly a polyethylene glycol, sorry, uh, glycol chains that are linked in that rotaxane, or it could be some sort of polyamine. If we think about that, if we add in some sort of proton source, we add in some acid to a polyamine on that, if I go back to this particular structure here. Um, so if I add in a polyamine to this, this tether here, and we add in protons, there's going to be a significant amount of um, electrostatic repulsion from this, um, which may um, prevent, some sort of prevent the uh, mechanical work from being stored. Um, but that's something that we need to look into. Um, so the last, or the last two things, we believe that we can measure this based on the, um, the heat that is released from the system. So we can use isothermal titration calorimetry or microcalorimetry um, to determine the amount of uh, heat that's released after we start to unwind um, those polymer chains. And we can also envision um, placing fret pairs on any number of these molecules. We can actually see once that the fret starts to occur, we can see that um, doing uh, some sort of fluorescence microscopy. All right, so our vision for this, um, we do have this as a single molecule, but we can also think about tethering this to some sort of surface. So instead of having, or in addition to having the rotaxane um, integrated with the Faringa motor, we can attach this to some sort of surface. So we can think about boring holes into some sort of, let's say, silicon surface and attaching our, um, our contraption, so to speak, um, to this, this material. As soon as that starts to wind, it will pull on um, the, the rest of the uh, architecture that we have developed. In this particular case, we actually have a magnet at the bottom of this um, particular, uh, I guess, molecule that we have envisioned. Um, and once that starts to rotate, when we, we release that disulfide bridge, we reduce it, it will start to uh, unwind. That will create an electro or a magnetic field. So we can harness that energy from that. Um, so that's, I guess, depicted in these, these cartoons. So as soon as we shine light on this, um, they'll start to twist, they'll entangle, we'll uh, start to spin this magnet here. And then we can think about breaking that disulfide. It will spin back, creating that magnetic field. And I believe that's all I have. So if you guys have any questions about our proposed research, I'd be happy to try and answer that. <laughs> Hopefully, I can answer that. Well, <laughs> you, team here. Yes, exactly. you, you, you probably can't because we, we talked about it uh, when I was doing my roving thing. But uh, I, would, I would just comment that you need to do a zeroth order uh, comparison looking at uh, your, your uh, power density and energy conversion efficiency against the obvious thing is a solar cell and a battery. Absolutely. Yeah, so how does that compare? And, and I totally get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's way outside the scope of what you could accomplish today, but very ambitious and, uh, and very cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. But, but, uh, okay, oh, quick comment. Yeah, along those lines, couldn't you uh, figure out uh, the energy density based on, first you're going to have to make some assumption of how many turns you can make and how much power can could, could be uh, uh, stored in that, uh, and then you, you, think you can pretty quickly, I think, come up with an energy density based on that uh, if you just have some idea of how many turns you can take without breaking the molecule. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much.